Hey, my up family. Again, happy Father's Day to all of our fathers out there. And, you know, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about what I felt as um, we were waiting for William to be born and the different emotions that all first-time fathers have. And there were days where I sat there and, you know, my hands started to shake and, and the hair in the back of my head would start to rise and I'd go, what am I doing? I, I can't be a dad. I, I don't know the first thing about being a dad. I mean, which way is up? And it started to feel like this, this really impossible task. And I'm like, well, and what, what, if I, what if I put him to bed wrong? Or what if I, I don't feed him right? He's wrong into the spoon? Or whatever silly things you can think of. And, and for me, it, it felt like mission impossible. And, and you even have theme music going on behind me, kind of in the back of my head. And, and sleep up about being a dad, and sometimes it felt like, man, I'm being asked to, to climb the outside of the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. And, and I'm thinking, like, that's, that's over a half of a mile tall. I'm, God, I'm not Ethan Hunt. How would you expect me to, to do this? And yet, we can all face those times where we feel like it's mission impossible. Uh, and if you've had some of those experiences, oh, well, this is just bigger than me. This is Mission Impossible. Go ahead and mention those in the chats. And for our message today, the, the disciples were starting to face perhaps what might have been their Mission Impossible. You see, in our passage for today, which by the way is coming out of Luke 9 verses 1 through 6, so go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. And uh, in this part of Luke's narrative, Jesus gathers his disciples around them and says something like, hey guys, it's time. You know, you've been following me for a year, year and a half. You, you know how I operate. Now it's your turn. So I've given you power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So go, proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. And the disciples are sitting there starting to scratch their heads and look at each other. And, and they're like pointing around and going, wait, what? And, and probably Peter, because he was a loud mouth of the group, pipes up and goes, wait, Jesus, um... So we've seen you cast out demons. We've seen you rebuke fevers and they've left people. We've seen you heal lepers. We've seen you raise paralytics up and they're instantly able to walk. We've seen you raise people from death. We've seen you calm storms. I mean, even last week you healed a woman who had an issue of blood and you didn't even know it. You had to turn around and go, hey, who touched me? And now you expect us to do that? And Jesus replies, Yes, I've given you power and authority over all demons and cure diseases. So go, proclaim the kingdom of God and heal, just like I've been doing. But Jesus, the disciples may shriek, that's impossible, we're not you. And Jesus may have replied, that's okay. I've given you power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Now go, proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. And if we follow Jesus, that is our task. That's our mission. And we don't have to be Ethan Hunt to do it. In the Lord's Prayer, uh, right at the beginning, it says, Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done. That is not mission impossible. That is mission possible. And so our slogan for today actually comes from Mission Impossible movie. So uh, at the beginning, there's always this secret folder that comes out and uh, the recording will say, your mission, if you choose to accept it. Uh, and that's where our slogan comes from. So your mission, as a follower of Jesus Christ, is to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. <clears throat> Lord, as we start to unpack this message, I pray that you would just so generously, so graciously open our hearts and minds to receive your power and authority, that we would walk confidently in the power and authority of your name, and that we would see you do great things as we bear witness to your kingdom. God, I pray, let it be done, and let these words not be mine, but be yours. In your wonderful name I pray. Amen. Now, before I forget, let's go ahead and read that passage out of our Bibles, and then we'll dig right in. So here is Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And he, Jesus, called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. 
And he said to them, take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and do not have two tunics. Verse 4, and whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever, and wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they, the disciples, departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Your mission as a follower of Christ is to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now as we break this down, I want us to kind of follow the, that movie plot of these um, incredible spy movies. So first we're going to talk about the tools or the gadgets and the gizmos that we get as we do God's mission. And so in Luke 9.1, where Jesus says uh, he gives them power and authority over all demons and cure diseases. And so these are your rubber mask machines like they have in Mission Impossible, and uh, they're even better than James Bond's uh, tricked out Aston Martin. It's the power of God and God's own authority. So we break that down. Power in the Greek is the word dunamis. And while, yes, we do get our modern word dynamite from that Greek word, the two mean completely different things. So Jesus is not going around blowing up mountains, plain and simple. But what it means is, very simply, to be able or to have the capacity to do something. And in the Old Testament, power was one of the personal characteristics of God. It was his ability, which we see in um, how he speaks creation and how he delivers Israel. And when we move forward to the New Testament and look at it in Luke, the Holy Spirit and power are linked together. They cannot be separated. Wherever you see something happening in power in Luke, it's also the function of the Holy Spirit. They're together. You can't separate them. And to, these miracles, these acts of power, are the very things that pointed to the kingdom of God. So the theological dictionary of the New Testament writes this, the miracles of Jesus are part of the invading dominion of God, i.e. kingdom of God, which Jesus brings with his own person in proclamation and act. They are the dominion of God overcoming and expelling the sway of demons and Satan. Like the whole history of Jesus, his miracles are an eschatological event. And what that means is, Jesus' ministry, his miracles, the power and authority given to him, means that God's reign and rule are now being ushered into this time and space. And it is through faith that the believer shares in that rule of God. Now, this is really important. I'm going to unpack this a little bit. When you turn to Genesis chapter 1, and you read verse 28, uh, we read at the end of creation that God blessed humanity, man and woman, and he says to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. And so in creation, what we see is God reigning and ruling over all he's made. He sets up a garden within this incredible creation. He plants man and woman there, and then he says, as I have ruled in creating, now you rule in bringing productivity out of that creation. And so humanity is actually intended to rule with God, to rule on his behalf. That's part of what it means to be the image of God. So as God's image, being made in the image of God, men and women were to share in God's divine rule over the earth. And we actually see this in Psalm uh, chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, where you, the Lord, have made humanity just a little lower than the heavenly beings, and you crowned them with glory and honor as God's kingly representatives. You have given humanity dominion over the works of their hands. And so what that means is God already initially shared his power, the ability to do things in the created world. And then Jesus has also given us authority. And authority is a little bit different than power. We'll unpack that. And authority, it's the Greek word exousia. And it simply means the ability to perform an action to the extent that there are no hindrances in the way. 
Now that can still sound a little bit confusing, so um, let's use an illustration to kind of help uh, unpack that. So imagine you have a race car. The car can go 200 miles an hour. That's power. It has the ability to do that. But if I were to take that race car in the streets of Wyandotte and go 200 miles an hour, that would be wrong. Now if I take that race car and I go to Michigan International Speedway, I now have the authority to go 200 miles an hour. That hindrance of speed limit has been lifted. And so power is the ability. And then authority is the right to use that ability. And authority is intimately bound up with the will of God. It is God's, so when we look at God's will, it is God's will to restore relationships, to undo the effects of sin and evil, to work justice, to bring lives into wholeness through physical, emotional, spiritual, and relational healing. And <clears throat> Jesus gives us both the power to do these things and the authority to um, function and to act and to speak according to God's will. And so the very same power and authority that Jesus ministered into, um, according to Joel Green, is now extended to the apostles who will exercise them as participants in Jesus' ministry in a way that points forward to the apostolic mission in Acts. And that apostolic mission continues today. You and me, your children, we participate in God's apostolic mission. <clears throat> and this is really important because that concept of authority, as we talked about a little bit ago in Genesis 1, is what part of that restoration process. So uh, many of us have been in the mall or at a park or an amusement park, and we've seen the families where the kids are running the show, and it's really, really embarrassing for the parents. And the kids are like, I want my ice cream, I want my shirt changed, I want this, I want that. And some of us walk away in an unsanctified moment, we think, wow, the, the patients are really running the asylum today. And that's kind of what happened. You see, in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve listened to the serpent, they vacated their position of authority over the heavens and the earth. Instead of them ruling on God's behalf and subduing the creation and having dominion over the beasts, they instead allowed the beasts to have dominion over them. So when Jesus is now giving power and authority to the disciples, and they're announcing the kingdom of God coming back, what he's doing is he's saying the, the thing that sin messed up, the authority that sin stole, is now being righted. And that's why these signs and wonders are so important to the proclamation of the kingdom, because they point to God's power and authority over even the physical things of this world. <clears throat> And in fact, even in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, uh, that as we look forward to the final consummation of all things, uh, we're told that those who are faithful in Christ will be priests of God and reign with Him. And so it's a restoration of the genesis of the creative Eden and the creative um, relationships that were there that Jesus is now restoring. And so that's why having authority and power is so key. And those are ours. They're, they're our tools to accomplish his mission. Now, next, Jesus gives them their objective. In Luke 9, verse 2, Jesus sends them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. To proclaim the kingdom of God is to proclaim that God's reign and rule over creation is being reestablished. And God does it through partnering with humanity. And it's because Jesus, who God become, became flesh, now allows us to come back into relationship with God. He now restores us to our right place under God's authority. And now we can reign and rule as God has originally commanded. <clears throat> and in this verse, we see that part of that objective is not just proclaiming that Jesus is uh, the resurrected Son of God, that He is now on the throne of heaven, but that we are also to heal. And the Greek word for healing is uh, theomai, and 
Luke uses this word in his various forms often to describe Jesus' ministry and how he healed the leper, how he healed the woman with uh, the issue of blood, how he gave sight to the blind, how he raised up the paralytic man. And the point of all these different stories wasn't just for the miracles themselves, but to lead people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. You see, every miracle and every sign is to point to the kingdom of God, God's role being reestablished over all, the undoing of the effects of sin, and to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ. The miracles of Jesus are simple and yet powerful signs that the prophecies in the Old Testament of the age of salvation coming through him are now being fulfilled, and that the royal dominion of God has come. And the disciples are now called to function in the exact same way. So the intention of Jesus now is to equip the disciples, you and me, our children, um, everybody who declares Jesus as Lord, to be effective witnesses of this imminent kingdom. And when we go out and we share what Jesus is doing, when we share the kingdom of God, we should be expecting that signs and wonders and miracles and healings would occur. You see, um, <clears throat> throughout the biblical narrative, the concept of salvation and healing are tied together intimately. Um, in the Old Testament, the word for soul is the word nephesh. And it literally meant uh, that a human being was a living, breathing body. It wasn't the modern concept of soul that we have, where we have body and soul. That's actually a platonic idea that really didn't take root until the Enlightenment. And so when we think about it biblically, when we say, um, when we want to reach people for the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, that they would be saved, that they would be restored in relationship to God, we're also saying that through, not only is the relationship restored, not only is there internal healing spiritually, but that same salvation is provision for their external healing, for their healing of relationships, for the healing of our physical bodies. There is no distinction between body and soul in the biblical narrative. And so when we are called to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and to heal, they're actually one in the same thing. And so, if we're having power and authority to do the things of God, and we're given this one purpose, which is to proclaim the kingdom of God, to walk in that authority Jesus has given us, healing should naturally be a part of our witness. Now, another word that Luke uses in this passage for healing, uh, it's translated pure in the ESV, is the Greek word therapeuing. Uh, it's where we get our English therapy from, and this word, which is sometimes synonymous with EMI, uh, however, it emphasizes a willingness to serve. It is saying that I choose to go to somebody and to help them in their time of need. But it also expresses a personal relationship with the person you're serving. You're getting to know them. You're sharing life with them. You're building community and fellowship with them. And so it's, it's not this kind of dispassionate doctor that we all kind of hear stories of that um, uses really big, gigantic words to tell you have a you know, common cold. But instead, it's that really gentle nurse who comes and sits at your bedside, who listens to you, who tells stories, who gets to know you and your family, and, and at every possible moment uh, consistently demonstrates that you are valuable and you are important to her. Not just because you're important, but because she has invested herself into you and into your life. And doctors do this too. It's that kind of therapy that we are to offer as followers of Jesus. And so as we think about this command to go and proclaim the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the kingdom of God, and to heal, uh, Ben Witherington writes this for Luke. Salvation, at its very core, has to deal with God's gracious act of forgiving sins through Jesus, which also causes the moral, mental, emotional, spiritual, and even physical transformation of the individual. And so we are called to 
wholeness and to bring wholeness into the lives of everybody who's around us. And so as you go back to our slogan, your mission as a follower of Jesus is to go, proclaim the kingdom of God, and to heal. Okay, so we have our tools, power and authority. We have our objective, proclaim and heal. And yet, we still need some parameters. We need some instructions. And this is the next thing that Jesus does. And you kind of think of it as a teenager who is getting ready to drive by their own for the first time. You know, they have the power of the car. They'll start up and they can go down the road. And they have the authority of their driver's license. They, they know that they are, are allowed to do this and to utilize that power in a productive way. And yet, as any responsible dad and mom know, uh, you can't just give a teenager the keys and say, have at it. And so in my family, uh, my very first car was a 1988 Chevrolet Astro van. Uh, and the picture here is not the actual van, it's the closest one I could find. And um, uh, my brother did try to destroy it, apparently he didn't like it very much, but uh, he fell and so I got it. And when I started driving, one of those instructions my dad gave me was one, uh, zero extra passengers. So I could drive myself, I could drive my brother, but that was it. And you think, well that's a minivan, you got a whole bunch of extra seats. No. You see, over the years, my brothers and I would flop them and kind of break them. So my dad had taken all the back seats out. So essentially, I had this wonderful two-seat cargo van that had more space and luggage than a teenager could ever need or want. And that was my first car. And then a couple years later, we found my second car, which was a 1996 Saturn SC1. Uh, again, not my actual car, but very close to what I had in the picture. And if you tried to sit in the back seat, you had to be about three feet tall, otherwise you would have to consume your knee because the back seat was so small. Again, my dad was reinforcing that no extra passengers rule. And so Jesus, again, knows that, man, there's a lot of, um, you're, you're having power over demons, you've got power to heal, I've given you my authority, the authority I have in speaking the world into existence. We've got to put some parameters around here so you guys don't abuse these things. And that's where we pick up in Luke 9, verse 3. Jesus tells his disciples, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and don't have two tunics. And to our modern ears, that sounds a little bit funny. But uh, to the best of our knowledge, Jesus, we think, is referencing the... Uh, traveling teachers of his day. So they would commonly have a staff, they would have a little satchel or bag to carry their stuff in. And it was actually a sign of status and honor to welcome a traveling teacher into your home. So if you wanted to look better than your neighbor, you would invite this traveling teacher in. And for the traveling teacher, if, um, and this goes into Luke 9 4, and that whatever house you enter, stay there, don't depart from it. Um, you would try to find the best place in town to stay because that would elevate your status. And what Jesus is saying is, it's not about you. You're not supposed to really get anything from this. You're just supposed to proclaim the kingdom of God, freedom to the oppressed, and heal people. It's not about what it does for you. It's about what you can do for them through me. And um, just... As I was thinking about this, especially the whatever house you enter, stay there, the, from Luke 9-4, it reminded me when I was in uh, elementary school, I was second grade, and I had a friend who always had the best video games. And uh, we found out that he had gotten a Super Nintendo and the world's most amazing game, Super Mario Kart. And all of my friends fought over who would get to go to his house to play his game because we wanted the cool factor. We wanted to show up on Monday and say, hey, I beat Bowser on Rainbow Road. Not because we cared for our friend, because we cared for our own status. And Jesus is saying, no, it, to proclaim the kingdom, to heal people, is not for your cool status. It's so that we can see people transformed by the power and glory of Jesus Christ, we can grow back into a relationship with God Almighty, and that the effects of sin would be reversed. That is the purpose. It's not our own egos that we're feeding. We're to give all honor and glory and praise to God above. And so now they know the parameters. Okay, travel light, <clears throat> stay in one place, 
And then in Luke 9, 5, Jesus says, oh, by the way, people aren't always going to listen to you. So when they don't receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Now, <clears throat> Craig Keener explains this, uh, this symbolic action like this. Shaking the dust off essentially means treating these Jewish cities as if they were unclean pagan cities. No defiling dust of which a pious Jew would want to bring into the Holy Land. A place like the temple was so holy that those entering would, at least in pious theory, not want the dust of the rest of the land on their feet. So what this is doing is Jesus is saying if people reject the message of the kingdom of God, that God is ruling and reigning over all creation and has now brought that kingdom through Jesus Christ, that they are like the pagan nations and they have chosen to serve idols. Now that sounds a lot like the beginning of chapter 8 that we read uh, a few weeks ago. And so that's the mission. So your mission as a follower of Christ is to go proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. We have our assignment, proclaim and heal. We have our tools, power and authority. We have our parameters. <clears throat> Half light, stay in one place, and if they don't receive you, move on to the next one. And all that's left to do now is the mission. This is mission possible. Your mission, as a follower of Jesus, is to go and proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now, before we wrap this up, I want to look at verse 5 a little bit from a different perspective, because... Uh, Jesus, even here it says there will be people who will not receive you. And we know from the uh, narrative in the book of Acts that this could be very, very painful. That they would be rejected at times. And so when we go back to the movies Mission Impossible, you know that, that secret mission message? It always ends with this. As always. Should you or any member of your IM force be caught or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. And when we think about this from a biblical perspective, however, we know that we can anticipate and perhaps even expect that there would be resistance, that there would be uh, perhaps even persecution, and we are fulfilling the very thing that Jesus has called us to do. In fact, um, it is through the church's faithful death according to the book of Revelation, that um, that is how the world comes to faith in Jesus. And so in Revelation chapter 12, verses 10 and 11, it says that we conquer through the blood of the Lamb, which is participating in the death of Christ, and by the word of our testimony. And it is through that in which the kingdom of God and the authority of Christ is established. So if I give you the full mission statement, it would go like this. Your mission as a follower of Jesus Christ is to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. If you or any member of your team be caught or killed, you have conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. And in that sacrifice, the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ have come. So that means our witness, our proclaiming, and our healing will not always go the way we hope. It means that it will cost us something. It doesn't always mean martyrdom in our modern sense of the word where uh, we die because we bear witness, though it could mean that. But it means that we must be willing to give up our personal rights so that even, and maybe even endure personal injustice so that we can fight for the justice of others, because that's what the kingdom of God calls for. It means that we must be willing to go and to serve and to cure, to therapeuing people who are unlike us. It means that we must be willing to enter situations that may expose us to personal harm. You see, the uh, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament mentions this about the ancient world. Uh, it says that in times of pestilence, when pagans often left their sick relatives to lie helpless, 
even throwing them and their dead bodies into the streets to avoid infection. It was many Christians, followers of Jesus, who devoted themselves to ministering to the sick and the dying, even among the pagans who hated them, even to the point of their own self-sacrifice. That is the mission you've accepted. Because you follow Jesus, you've already declared Him Lord. And because He is Lord, His mission is your mission. So you've already said yes. Your mission, as a follower of Jesus Christ, is to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. If you or any member of your team should be caught or killed, you will have conquered by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. And in that sacrifice, the power of the kingdom of God and the authority of His Christ will have come. So as we wrap up and we uh, listen to Michael and Jessica just kind of give us some time to reflect, I want us to take a moment and pray. And I want us to ask Jesus, first and foremost, for the confidence and the boldness to proclaim faithfully the kingdom of God. Second, I want us to pray and ask that Jesus will give each of us the Holy Spirit and the experience of His power and His authority so that we can go proclaim faithfully and heal. And finally, I want us to pray and ask for the strength and the endurance so that when we do face resistance, that we can do so and persevere and in the end, Every voice declaring now, Jesus Christ is Lord. 
not afraid anymore. He is Lord. He is Lord. opportunity to come and to share. It was a great, great uh, privilege to be able to do that. And I pray that you were encouraged and blessed as we dove into God's Word. And so I'm going to speak the blessing over you and get just a couple parting uh, comments. So, Lord Jesus, I speak your blessing over your people. The Lord blesses you, the Lord keeps you. The Lord makes his face shine on you, and the Lord is gracious unto you. The Lord lifts his countenance over you, and the Lord gives you peace. And church family, uh, before you go, please fill out the online communication card. Uh, one, it gives us a chance to know who joined us, but also that's how all of our dads can enter for our Father's Day giveaway drawing. So dads, online communication card, it should be uh, posted in the chat, or just hit the link right up at the top of the screen so we know you're here. Uh, and then also, everybody, just make sure your email addresses are up to date and you're checking those regularly so that uh, you're not missing vital information about how uh, we at Final Family Church are going to reopen our doors. So thanks, everybody. Treehouse will be next. <laughs>